two, one. All right. I am live or recording rather with uh, Hart Edge. Uh, how are you, my friend? I'm doing all right, man. How are you? Everything's going well. I'm in, I'm in Kiev, Ukraine, and uh, lockdown is officially pretty much over here. What about you? Uh, I don't think lockdown is even close to over here. I, I'll be honest, I, I kind of stopped tracking all of it, man. I, uh, I don't know. It's, uh, yeah, <laughs> it's like Groundhog Day. You wake up every day, it's kind of the same thing. And, it's hard to, yeah, I understand. It's hard, hard to track if your government is uh, actively waging war against your freedom. <laughs> yeah so so i usually start with uh I, tell you, I usually start with where we met or when we met i'm trying to remember i think i feel like it was vegas um money 2020 or something no we met, yeah we met at money 2020 at um uh, you know in las vegas at one of these fancy hotels um at that time money 2020 it was probably the third one was when you came and uh this was the beginning of Bitcoiners kind of making a stronger group appearance because at the first two, it was just Charlie Schramm and Eric Voorhees who I saw there. And, and I was not really like, I wasn't an Eric Voorhees of the community. I was just like a huge fan. And I was organizing this little meetup in Las Vegas. And I swear, we didn't think this was an industry. I was running a startup in Las Vegas that was called Zaldi. And we were integrating to the point of sale systems of high volume restaurants in Las Vegas. And so that's what took me to Las Vegas and being in Las Vegas was a great way to always go to the best conferences and fintech was my jam. I was like, I love payments. I love da data. I love the fact that payments, especially fintech, taking us to the emerging markets and tapping into where the majority of human beings are. And then in the midst of my fintech obsession, I got Bitcoin obsessed. And then after my Bitcoin obsession, I got fully crypto obsessed thanks to Ethereum. Okay, interesting, interesting. Okay, so let's, uh, yeah, so let's maybe retrace. Uh, you know, like I was saying, Hartej, one of the things I'm trying to do on this show is I always say like Bitcoin, you know, now Bitcoin's kind of like everywhere, right? I mean, I think literally uh, Elon Musk put it on his, uh, on his Twitter, what was that? I said Bitcoin is the mother. Bitcoin is the mother. Yeah, Jack Dorsey's got it. It will always be the mother. I could care less that Elon Musk and Jack Dorsey have it as their profile. It's like, welcome to the to the party. Welcome. Exactly, exactly, exactly. No, I, th I think you you and I could probably care less, right? I'll tell you a story from how we were like 2011, 2012, 2013, 2014. It's 2021. Like, yeah, your, your fucking profile should be hashtag Bitcoin. <laughs> um and, and well well for you and i it's kind of obvious and inevitable um you know i think for the rest of the world it's still relevant and and a bit of a shock because you know jack dorsey and if you consider what happened uh in the last couple of weeks with twitter and all that without going into too much um if you also consider elon musk now i think overtaking jeff bezos as the wealthiest man on earth i mean these people aren't yeah. stupid they're obviously yeah. onto something and uh and so, so, but, but what I always say is, is that with Bitcoin is really a function of like people, right? It's not, it's nothing but code. It's, it's, it's the stories behind kind of everyone's uh, Bitcoin journey that, that make Bitcoin what it is today. And so, you know, you've been one of the people that I've known for a very long time. Um, always enjoy our conversations, very colorful and, and really interesting. You know, and some people, their story, Artej, start with, uh, you know, World War II great, great grandparents, some people that starts with their first job. I mean, I don't, I don't really care, like wherever you feel your story starts. Yeah, I mean, starts in terms of how I got into crypto, how I got into Bitcoin. No, well, this, okay, so let me clarify a bit more. So I really try and capture your story before you got into Bitcoin right so like your story and then and then after uh you learned about bitcoin and kind of how it maybe changed the arc of your worldview and you know kind of how um you know obviously ethereum and all those things came after but like you said bitcoin was kind of the mother and was i assume a bit of a trajectory point in your career yeah bitcoin is the mother bitcoin will always be the mother in my opinion um no matter whether there's ethereum or whatever else comes my story begins in uh, central New Jersey. I was born and raised in New Jersey. Uh, I'm an American. My parents uh, immigrated there from India in the late 1970s, early 80s. And um, uh, I went 
to school there. Um, I got indoctrinated to the American public school system. Some things I won't, something I won't be doing to my kids. Uh, I went to college, uh, Penn State, something I probably won't be doing with my kids as well. <laughs> I studied finance and um, I went to this big party school and the biggest benefit was that I learned how to talk to human beings. So um, it was great. I went to Penn State. Uh, like a lot of other South Asian descent kids in my area, uh, the, we were trying to make as much money as we can after graduation. You know, we grew up in uh, a mostly middle, upper middle class area of Princeton, New Jersey. And uh, I have, I'm a first generation American and I have Indian American parents that have, that had and still have very high expectations of me. And so the bar was set pretty high. My father uh, was a civil engineer. He's no longer with us. And my mother is a scientist, a chemist. And um, they, I'm grateful that they were able to uh, put and give us a great education. Uh, and so I was supposed to become an investment banker. I studied finance in college. I did multiple summers on Wall Street. I studied finance. But while studying finance in college, I was actually a full-on entrepreneur. I was importing clothing from China. I was printing clothing for frats and sororities. Uh, after graduating, instead of going to Wall Street, I opened up a food truck. And while running this food truck, if anyone's from New York City watching this, they know about 53rd and 6th Chicken and Rice, uh, the Halal Guys, which is now a nationwide franchise. But back in the day when we were kids, we would go to New York. There was a, these two trucks that had chicken and rice platters. And we brought that concept to Penn State after I graduated. And while running this food concept, I was teaching myself how to code. And I was deep diving into the Y Combinator 500 startups, tech stars ecosystem and watching demo day videos from Y Combinator. Uh, at that time, round four, I just graduated of Y Combinator. Round three was Airbnb. Uh, to give you perspective, like this Airbnb had entered their first accelerator, uh, you know, um, it was like Alexis Ohanian was in Y Combinator still, the founder of Reddit. And, uh, and now he's running a crypto fund called In Initialized Capital. Um, and <clears throat> yeah, I was deep diving into the, into the startup world while running a food truck, avoiding, avoiding the financial world. I didn't, I didn't like finance. It didn't fit my personality. Uh, didn't, the world didn't suit me. And uh, my father actually was sick at the time. He had brain cancer. So I uh, moved back home after uh, running this food truck for a stint after graduating from college. And I essentially wanted to amass as much knowledge as I can, learn a lot, teach myself how to code, uh, digest a lot of information. I taught myself everything I could about social media marketing and brand building and designing and building companies and making pitch decks and everything I could do as someone non-technical to attract the love and attention and respect of someone technical. My aim was to go to New York tech meetups and to hang out with engineers and to understand how engineers think and find my, uh, find my Wozniak. And I wanted to build something amazing. And uh, I started applying to tech uh, accelerators while taking care of my father. And my father, I was like his home nurse. He had brain cancer. And uh, I got accepted into an accelerator for my first startup, which is what brought me to Vegas eventually, Zaldi. Uh, I got accepted into that accelerator called Startup Chile. The Chilean government gave me $40,000 equity free to move down to Santiago. I got accepted a day after my father passed away after six long years of brain cancer. And I woke up and I, I looked at my email and there's still people mourning in my house. And I had gone through a long uh, battle uh, uh, with this with my father, both mentally and physically. And so it was quite a relief to get into this program. My mother gave me her blessings to go down there. And I was relieved. I was like, I'm out. I'm out of here, this area. Thank you very much. It's been a pretty dark last six years of my life. Um, out. And uh, I left. I moved to Santiago, went from there to uh, Argentina. My co-founder was an Israeli Argentine named Gal Dolber, who helped me build my last company. And uh, he taught me a lot about functional programming because we built that entire startup in a language called Clojure. And so uh, that's how I got really into functional programming in terms of understanding the power of Clojure. And all of that knowledge is still very applicable today 
in Bitcoin and in crypto. Um, and then I moved to Las Vegas to keep building the startup. It was a, we built a mobile POS system that integrated into really old POS systems. And we got, we just deep dived into that and moved to Las Vegas. And it's while I was in Las Vegas that I met people that were super into Bitcoin, that were some of the pillars of the industry. Uh, my friend Yo Sub Kwan being one of the biggest ones, he was, um, he had founded a company called LaunchKey. And after that, he started one of the first crypto exchanges in America with Jaron Lukasiewicz called Coinsider. And so I'm, I just fell into the right friend circle and everyone was always talking about Bitcoin. And uh, I started reading about it and I was living with my friend from Senegal named Fode Diop. And both of us went down what a lot of people cliche call the rabbit hole. And yeah, we went down the rabbit hole. At that time, the only material available was really, uh, it was obviously the Satoshi's white paper. There was a lot of Nick Zabo essays that helped us. There were some amazing YouTube videos from Hal Finney and from uh, Nick Zabo that were online at the time. And it was, it was just the beginning of, uh, well, I wouldn't even say the beginning, but there was, it wasn't as much content as now for Andreas Antonopoulos or Max Kaiser. But uh, my entertainment during meals for a while became Max Kaiser TV show. Uh, Andreas Antonopoulos speeches, which I began regurgitating at meetups, like, guys, you got it, you got to, you know, everyone's like, man, you're so prolific. And I'm like, it's not me. All credit of the speech goes to Andreas Antonopoulos. I just, I'm regurgitating, uh, <laughs> you know, and uh, <clears throat> there was a meetup that I didn't start in Las Vegas. Uh, that there was already a great community there. But as you know, crypto has, has bear markets and people disappear and there's, you know, uh, so there was a thing that hey, Artej, can you hear me? I'm I'm losing you, man. I can. Sorry, sorry, I'm back. I'm you're here. back. You're back. Continue, continue. Yeah, <clears throat> I was saying that uh, there's a stint of time in Las Vegas where we were running the the Las Vegas crypto meetup, and uh, it was a, a wonderful time of like fostering growth, both. Bitcoin and Ethereum, and there was no um, animosity between any any groups. There was, there's always been maximalists, um, but uh, at least in our small little Las Vegas community, there was all it was all love because it was the birth of something brand new. Uh, and then I started Hosho with with Yo Sub Kwan, who kind of got me into a lot of things, and uh, that happened by you know a group of friends are personally investing into Ethereum, and we realized that people that have the right cybersecurity background and quality assurance background and white hat hacker background need to be auditing the code of blockchains and smart contracts. And uh, I'll be honest, for a while, that was not applicable to the Bitcoin space. It was applicable pretty much only to Ethereum ERC-20 tokens and ICOs. We audited the majority of the ICOs that happened. And it's amazing that now actually, because of DeFi, Things are coming back and there are smart contracts being written and Bitcoin is being applied in the DeFi space. And so uh, now our applicability as auditors is much more directly um, impacting Bitcoin than it did it had before. You know, we were just touching ERC-20 smart contracts and now there's smart contracts that will involve at least some form of Bitcoin, whether or not you consider wrapped Bitcoin, Bitcoin, that's another discussion, but yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Well, I'm fascinated. Um, you know, Hartej, uh, okay, so, you know, you know, I want to maybe keep this focused on your story because it's fast. I could go a million different ways, but I want to just make sure I capture your story. So, oh. what? I said I didn't get to the now, but it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I do have a lot of questions around, you know, Ethereum and smart contracts, but again, I don't want to derail it from, from you know, again, capturing kind of your story. So, what, what happens next uh, in your journey? Yeah, so... Uh... After that, um, we built Hosho, we grew Hosho. It was the ranked number one blockchain uh, security firm. We pretty much tried to invent what that meant to be a blockchain cybersecurity company. It wasn't a thing. There, there was uh, blockchain businesses and there was cybersecurity people and very few people from a cybersecurity hacking background had enough incentive to be in the crypto space. And really good engineers aren't necessarily security minded and they often are not very security minded in terms of how they're developing uh, you just you ship 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 code and so 
um, yeah, we grew Hosho really fast to like 4 million in revenue in the first like few weeks of, uh, of business. And uh, we grew it to like 37 employees, but we didn't survive the bear market in 18 and pivoted everything, uh, including my life, uh, to moving to Ukraine. I met my beautiful wife. We started a family and now we're running Zokio, which is part blockchain cybersecurity, part blockchain development. And now we're in the process of launching a, a DeFi studio. And so, yeah, we're incubating, investing, we're securing, we're building, we're doing a lot on a lot of different chains. So uh, okay, I have a question for you. So what is it about Ethereum that caught your imagination early on? Um, yeah, what, what was it that, that Ethereum enabled, you know, uh, people to do that, let's say Bitcoin couldn't? Uh, smart contracts, just in the beginning. Right. I mean, yes, people have uh, like Rootstock early on has said we're going to bring smart contracts onto the Bitcoin blockchain, but technically that has yet to be proven true. <laughs> right. We can't. We we still can't really use uh, the usability of smart contracts on the Bitcoin blockchain is nowhere near where it the it has been on Ethereum. Ethereum is kind of like it. It it was designed to kind of become like what is WordPress to the internet, right? Like you build websites on WordPress and you know it's probably not gonna be the most secure, but it's really easy and fast to just ship. And you're like, all right, I'm just gonna plug in my credit card and blah, 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 I made a website, my dear. And like, that's what making an ERC-20 token has become. There's so much open source code out there. Everyone is coming to us for an audit and they're like, we just forked this we just forked Bancor, guys. We just forked Algorand. We just made it. That's the point of the space. Um, but yeah, I mean, <laughs> what it, <clears throat> it, Ethereum? Every blockchain has its own unique use cases, and when it came to things like functional payments and actually wanting to spend my tokens and not being a store of value, Ethereum had had and continues to have more attraction than Bitcoin for that specific use case. And it's it, but, it, but for me, it's, you know, there's always gonna be a use case uh, that's very specific to each blockchain. And as Bitcoin expands its ecosystem and we build more on side chains and this lightning becomes, more developed upon, we're slowly seeing that an increasing number of things that we were relying upon to say maybe explore on Ethereum or maybe Ethereum 2.0 or some other blockchain, I think will come back to Bitcoin and the Lightning ecosystem. And it already is. Example? Messaging. Interesting. Um, really excited about like messaging and like you, anybody's developer gut for a while has been, if I'm going to decentralized messaging, let me do it on another blockchain other than Bitcoin. But, you know, I, I personally know some people working on mesh network messaging on the Lightning Network. And I think, shout out Foded, yo, uh, that's really interesting. And feel, yeah, some of my friends have recently been opening up my eyes to the increasing power of the Lightning Network. It, it, may, not, it, may, it may not be institutional friendly, but it solves a lot of problems. And that's kind of the thing, right? I'm very open. There's gonna be things, there's gonna be blockchains that are forks of Tendermint that are designed just for really big banks to use and really big family offices. And their use case is thinking just about the needs of institutions, not about Satoshi's vision of decentralization and no KYC and freedom. Like there is room for both. We, we have to respect the fact that the institutions want to come into the digital asset ecosystem. It'll be partially Bitcoin and it'll be partially CBDCs. It'll be partially stable coins. It'll be partially other blockchains that possibly they write themselves.
Interesting. And and you you did talk about RSK and you said, well, where is it? And that's a good question, right? Where is it? Um, what do you think, I mean, technologically speaking, has kind of held Bitcoin back to be able to have that type of Turing complete smart contract capability? Um, and do you think it'll ever come to it? Is it just not part of the ethos and it's not even, you know, something to be thinking about or talking about? I don't know if I have a good answer to that question because, well, a part of, uh, I'm at a crosshairs myself um, with the answer to that question, to be honest. <laughs> a part of me wants to say that Bitcoin was never meant to do some of the things people are trying to make it do. And that's great, actually. Uh, I, I, I am okay with saying Bitcoin is a wonderful store of value. Um, but then when I see some of the progressions on the Lightning Network, I'm kind of like, but is it? It could be. It could be so much more. It's becoming so much more. Uh, and and Hartej, Lightning Network. Correct me if I'm wrong. Has nothing to do with uh, creating like a programmable solidity like layer or anything like that, right? Um, or I mean, you probably know more about this stuff. Like, it doesn't have that component. I guess. I mean, there's a lot of exciting things about it, but it's more focused towards payments. Am I am I correct? Yeah. I mean, that? it's a. I mean, Lightning Network's a layer two. It's right. It's a layer two payment protocol on top of Bitcoin, right? So it's on. It's it's layered on top of Bitcoin, and the main intention of it is to enable fast and secure payments on top of Bitcoin. And like, obviously, early on when we started hearing about this, when we were talking about Visa, a lot of the criticisms against Bitcoin were, well, Visa can do this many transactions, and Mastercard can do this many transactions. So your Bitcoin is nothing. And it's like Bitcoin wasn't meant for you to just go up and buy a piece of gum. <laughs> but you know, microtransactions on uh, on Lightning, it's a different story. Uh, you know, it's a very different story. Shout out cool. Elizabeth. Stark. Uh, Hartej, so so the second part of this is really about, so first of all, on your personal story, anything else you want to share on that front? It was fascinating. Thank you for, for sharing some of that because I'm sure um, it's not easy always, you know, going back into the past, but I appreciate you being so open. But anything else you want to share in terms of maybe like some takeaways or things you want people to maybe do uh, actually outside of my LinkedIn timeline that I've shared. The real timeline that I'd like to share with you and the people watching this is that um, my whole life I've looked for community. I've, I've, uh, I've lived a very interesting existence looking the way I do and being a first generation American. My parents are from India, like at home it was like India and outside it was America. Uh, there's a bit of a uh, mm, duality that I was raised with that can be tricky. Uh, you know, going to India as a young kid and your parents were like, this is where you're from. And you're like, what? And you're like playing N64 at home. It's complicated. Uh, so as I've tried to find my people, I'd say that the, uh, the crypto community, especially the, I'd say specifically the, um, initially when I met the Bitcoin community, it, it was so fast that I felt like I found my people. And I, and that was the most comforting feeling to not walk, but sprint towards this space and just in mm. time and read. And it was like, I all, I found, I, I had friends like you that I could hang out with and talk about so much. And we had so much in line uh, because of aligned philosophies. And, and I realized that when you align philosophies on economics, and on ways of life, like so much aligns in life. And so I'm, I guess I'm just so grateful for having found people in this community and having found my people. Uh, because no matter where I am in the world, I feel so not alone, thanks to this community. Uh, wow, that's touching, man. I, I yeah, that's, uh, I, I agree. I agree. I agree. Um, I actually remember when we first met and I remember when you were with, uh, you know, before you got into Bitcoin and your enthusiasm and excitement. And uh, I remember that time really, really uh, clearly. And so it's awesome to see people shift gears and move into this, uh, into this industry more full time and really devote their life to it. And really, you know, my, 
a lot of people ask me like, why the hell are you doing these daily kind of Bitcoin stories things? Like, you know, not many people really watch them, Sonny. You know that? Like, uh, I was like, oh, yeah, I know, but I'm, I'm doing it for- It's going to catch up, Sonny. Like I saw you <laughs> watch and before you know it, you're going to hit a <laughs> boop. It's like, you has got to be out there and consistent and you're a pillar of this industry. You've been, you know- I, I say to everybody, Unocoin was the first Bitcoin exchange in India, and it will be the last. And we know, like, like to, you know, I know that we delayed today's talk because India is trying to ban crypto again. And uh, it's not going to happen, in my opinion. And if it does, this be, uh, it'll be a temporary thing because I have faith in 1.4 billion Indians. I have faith in the... Uh, uh, people like Satvik, your founder, co-founder at, uh, at Unocoin, I have faith in seeing what Unocoin's founders did to pay lawyers out of their own pocket to fight the RBI for that many years to make sure India legalizes crypto. Um, now that crypto has such a larger community behind it, you have Sequoia-backed Indian exchanges now there competing with you. Um, if anything, Sequoia needs to come step up and start funding those lawyer bills that Sathbik has been paying to make sure that this does not move forward. Um, we already, you know, we have international VCs in the game now in India. So I don't think this will move forward uh, much more than it already has. I think that, yeah, well, <laughs> India is a complicated space uh, to, to conduct commerce in. And so I, I hope that it becomes a better place over the next few years for all of us around the world to. Uh, innovate in a place that has, well, it's it's the next China. You know, so many people around the world have have benefited from China's growth over the last decade. The next decade is India's. Yeah, man. Uh, no, I appreciate you bringing that up. I, I'm pretty sure a lot of people are aware of what's happening in India. Unfortunately, I'm not allowed to talk too much about what's going on. Just know that the wheels are turning. And uh, especially if you're if you're an Indian Bitcoin exchange owner, hit me up over DM. You know, I know most of you anyways, you're probably hearing from me, but we are, you know, we need to all work together and, and keep fighting for Bitcoin. I just think it's a bit ironic that the week that, you know, like I said, guys like Jack Dorsey and Tesla and, and the whole world is now thinking about Bitcoin, uh, you know, the Indian government introduces this. Hmm? Yeah, I mean, India, India can make some some backwards moves. Uh, they're trying to ban crypto, and they have the largest protest in the history of humanity happening on New Delhi's border right now from farmers, which is not being reported on the mass media. And uh, India can be a really tricky country when it comes to fundamental human rights. So when we talk about crypto, this is all connected. Uh, and in, the Indian government has not done a great job historically at respecting fundamental human rights. And so the war, when it comes to crypto, there's a word in Punjabi that comes to mind. It's satantrata. What does that, that mean? mean? Freedom. Hmm. Like when I hear the word satantrata, I think about hashtag Bitcoin. To me, satantrata means Bitcoin. Bitcoin means satantrata. Hmm. And this is what I, you know, when I think about part of why I'm not living in the United States at the moment and uh, why I'm trying to spend more time in India and innovating in India over the next decade has to do with Satantrata. It's all about freedom. And, you know, crypt, crypto is a massive answer. Decentralized finance is a massive answer to bringing freedom, especially to the emerging markets and the emerging economies. Hey, Hartesh, have you been following kind of the stuff going on in the U.S. with Wall Street bets? I mean, everybody's talking about it. <laughs> Any thoughts on it? It's the best answer to DeFi. It's the best answer to us to, to get to convince the whole world to realize that you're playing in a rigged system, in a rigged game. And that as soon as a group of Redditors started to call things out, the big boys did whatever they had to do with the whatever they are, big girls or big boys, I don't know. They did something to make sure that Robinhood and Discord and now Telegram are being encouraged to remove Wall Street bets. In fact, I even heard a rumor that Apple is pushing Telegram to remove Telegram from, Apple might remove Telegram from the App Store because of the fact that Telegram is the last place with the Wall Street bets group. Um, and yeah, I, 
I got nothing more to say about it other than that entire experience tells us why we need DeFi, why we need decentralized finance, decentralized exchanges, you know, things like the MetaMask wallet. Like it's been so easy since that happened, even just 48 hours to answer some of my noob New York City friends who were like, should I buy GameStop? Should I buy Dogecoin? And I'm like, just set up, like buy, buy Bitcoin, buy Ethereum, set up, set up a hardware wallet, set up MetaMask backed up to a hardware wallet, like touch, touch the two main cryptos and feel what it's like to work in that ecosystem before you go and rush to buy GameStop and Dogecoin. <laughs> Yeah, man. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's a bit of an awakening happening amongst like the millennials, right? They're probably, this is like, people are calling it like Wall Street, uh, Occupy Wall Street part two. <laughs> Pretty interesting. A lot, of, a lot of young kids have been on Robin Hood thinking, okay, like I need a hundred dollars by this weekend. Let me play with some penny stocks and like sitting in class there with their thumbs, just penny stock trading on Robin Hood. It's been probably the number one trader on Robin Hood is a degenerate gambling high school student in the United States. And uh, now in it's cool to see that in DeFi, you've got like yield.app, which is trying to be like Robin Hood for DeFi. And I'm wondering if, uh, wondering if a lot of young kids are going to start having similar uh, tendencies within the DeFi ecosystem by signing up for some of these apps, where, which are fundamentally like you insert Ethereum and then the app finds the best yield in a yield farm. They take their cut and you get more Ethereum back. <laughs> yeah, is it, that's Tim, right? Yeah, Tim Frost. Yeah, yeah. We went to Boost with him many years ago. I, I'm going to be t- chatting with him about it soon. Yeah, it's um, actually a venture studio company of ours. We, have you heard of Dig? Oh, really? Have you heard of Dig? Yeah, of course. That We helped uh, audit. We audited Badger Dig. I'm going to interview these guys too, I think next week. But they're they're they're, you know, close friends they're from toronto i'm curious can you can you just do a little tldr on it uh, i'm not gonna lie i'm uh, i'm a bit intrigued <laughs> uh, what do you want to know Let's... just uh, i don't know a couple sentences like okay for if i'll try to exp- hey are you there man i'm losing you again okay so my 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 tldr on it was that it's uh you can if you want to earn interest on your bitcoin and you're willing to put it on the ethereum network which I'm not, but I'm saying many might be. I know many others that are. Uh, you can earn some sort of yield. Is that is that correct? Because you alluded to the wrapped Bitcoin thing. I, I'm pretty sure a lot of people don't know about that. I mean, even though, because we're in the industry, but do you want to maybe just touch on it? And I don't know. I, I, I'd rather let them come on the show and explain it best, but essentially- Very you, good. You get to earn and you get to earn on your, uh, you get to earn on your Bitcoin within the Ethereum ecosystem. And- uh, I think it's a very interesting approach and you know you got you have 250 billion dollars worth of bitcoin in existence today Mm -hmm. and it's really really hard to imagine a future in which uh bitcoin is not used in DeFi products and like i i decentralized finance is fairly new it's a nuanced concept especially for mainstream audiences, right? And uh, like TLV is somewhere around 17 to $20 billion locked into DeFi at the moment. And it's like something, something like a 2000% uh, you know, increase in value year to date in DeFi. And um, so much of the excitement in DeFi today reminds me of, if it, to me, it feels like telling someone about paying attention to Bitcoin when Bitcoin was at like $300. I think it's important to pay attention to DeFi and understanding its nuances, both positive and negative, especially as a Bitcoiner. Um, When I mentioned wrapped Bitcoin, why I think it's controversial is that wrapped Bitcoin is centralized and is backed by BitGo. So the, the actual custody of the assets is held by BitGo. So now uh, in terms of Satoshi's vision and being, if you're going to be strict on that, this is not decentralized. Wait, hold on, hold on. on the Bitco point, can they run away with it? Or is there, are they using their, their unicorn fairy dust, multi-sig, blah, blah, blah. Everybody they says they have multi-sig and maybe they have a custom HSM. Maybe it's backed by 
uh, physical data centers, not AWS. Maybe it's insured. There's all kinds of stuff. But at the end of the day, it's not Satoshi's. Okay. Not Satoshi's vision. There is there is trusted intermediaries. It's not code that we're trusting. It's not a smart contract. It's not a permissionless blockchain that we're trusting, right? Like that's why DeFi is the best use. It's the best use case of permissionless. Per, DeFi is the best use case of permissionless blockchains that we've seen to date, in my opinion. And I think Badger is an amazing, amazing uh, experiment in this direction. And this experiment has been proven uh, to be doing extremely well. Um, and uh, I think that the, the token model of claiming your badgers and then locking your badgers in it and how a majority of badgers are actually locked in the system, something like 90 plus percent of tokens, badger tokens that have been released have been restaked into the ecosystem. And uh, then they released DIG, which is like an algo. It's an algo coin to Bitcoin with the rebase feature. And it's gone through three rebases. Um, I'll, I'll let, Chris, yeah. let Chris Spadafora get on the show and walk you through his vision. Much yeah, yeah, yeah. I got Chris. I got Chris coming on. And, and you know, go nuts and badger you out. I, it's just best, best not that I do it all. Our job was to audit the code. And I'll tell you when we audited that code, my team said, Artej, this might be some of the best code we've seen all year. And Chris's team came to us before. There was no hype. No, I didn't know what Badger was. No, there was no news about it. And Chris called me and was like, yo, I need an audit. Like, fit us in. All the auditors are super busy. Like, I need your help. You guys are the best. I'm like, fine. I know I'm the best. <laughs> uh, and so <laughs> um, our, they took their time. They had patience. They didn't give us a deadline. Um, we took our time to secure that code. Our job was to make sure that code does what its intended purpose was and what their white paper said it's supposed to do and fulfill their vision. It was really high quality code. It was a really high quality. And not just saying that because that token has performed well and now there's a huge community. Uh, now I look back on it and I'm like, wow, I should listen to my engineers even more when they say this is great code and I should ape into things when they say that. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I don't know too much about the project. And, you know, none of this is financial advice, blah, blah, blah. It's uh, it's more just, uh, you know, two guys talking. Um, okay, uh, to get back, sorry. Yeah, nothing is financial advice. I'll just <laughs> financial advice at all. <laughs> um, hey, Hartej, if we just want to shift gears now to kind of the, I mean, you, you've touched on Hosho and, and, and sorry, you said Hosho was kind of the name of the company early on and now it's Zokyo? Yeah, like Tokyo, but with the Z, Zokyo. And so both, I have an obsession with Japanese uh, because of Satoshi Nakamoto and I love Japan and I, I visited and I fell in love. Nihongo desu ne? Ah, Nihongo skoshi wo karimasu. Ah, watashi no namae wa Sunny desu. Ah. Go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, I just, I felt Hosho means security in Japanese. Zokyo means to augment in Japanese. And our Zokyo's vision is like, we are an augmentation of your team, whether it's security, technology, BD, sales, anything, let us augment. And so that was the goal there, we, Zokyo.io. And yeah, we're mostly based out of Ukraine and India. Our cybersecurity team is in Bangalore and uh, mostly blockchain engineering and investing blockchain research out of here in Ukraine. And then we have people scattered in more expensive places that do most of our sales in BD, Singapore, London, San Francisco, New York. How, what, how big is your team? Uh, so we're at like 40 something in Ukraine and nine in Bangalore and five salespeople scattered that are, Jason is in London uh, and four of them are scattered in different places. I, hey, so I, Hartej, uh, so you know, when we were talking, I think a couple months ago, you also mentioned a company called Quedro with a Q, I think. It, yeah, Credo, Credo. Credo, sorry, my bad. Uh, just curious, are you still affiliated with that company? Is that still going on? Or yeah, So I'm advising them. I invested in them. Uh, Anthony Foy and Brian Spector are the founders of this company. They're based out of London. Um, they call themselves and are, in fact, in a way, an institutional 
version of Lightning Network, right? And so they are trying to also fulfill Satoshi's vision, but for large institutions. And they've taken a stab at cross-chain atomic swaps, mainly right now between Bitcoin and Ethereum with, it's backed by custom HSMs. They use multi-party computation on their own blockchain network. And uh, the blockchain network is a fork of Tindermint. And um, multi-party computation is a concept in cryptography that essentially enables them to get rid of private keys. And uh, I, encourage, I encourage everybody who's into crypto uh, to understand this concept of cryptography called multi-party computation, MPC. And I think we're gonna start seeing, we already are seeing MPC become like a buzzword in our space. And you're gonna see a lot of wallets like Shapeshift uses Curve and Curve uses MPC. And Shapeshift accomplishes, uh, they accomplish you um, not having to self, you, you being able to self custody your assets through multi-party computation. And there's a lot of different ways you can use multi-party computation. Um, and there's some really great videos um, from the Technion University in Israel on YouTube, specifically about multi-party computation that for someone that's technically non-technical like me, yeah, they're digestible <laughs> mostly. Uh, I, I, and so yeah, MPC, uh, one of the, I'll give you a small analogy of how they explain MPC, which is like, Sunny and I are sitting at a dinner table with five friends and we wanna figure out the collective income of all seven of us. And the rule is that Sunny and I can't be sitting next to each other and being like, yo, I make $150,000. And you're like, hey, I make $200,000. And once we figure out exactly how much we earn, we can actually calculate and figure out how much everyone else earns. So there has to be those types of rules. But the game is, how can you figure out how much everybody earns collectively without exposing the individual identity of each person and how much they earn? Person A and B going eight, can they go? after going on a date, can we figure out if they want to go on another one? So if both of them say, yes, I want to go on a date, thumbs up, then they find out and they move on to the next step. But if one of them says no, and one of them says yes, they don't move forward. And it doesn't expose that one of them said yes, and one of them says no. I hope that makes some sense, but- It, it just kind of cut out at the, at the most important point. So all I heard was some people in a room talking about salaries and then them going to dating. So I, I missed the part in between. <laughs> so basically, oh- <laughs> Oh, okay. <laughs> so multi-party computation enables anonymity where a group of people at a table could be saying, I want to figure out how much we earn in salary collectively and uh, without exposing how much each of you own individually. And so the rule is Sunny and I can't be sitting next to each other and exposing how much each of us earn. And if we did, then we can calculate how much others are earning. I got that. But with the dating part, I didn't get Dating part is... Can I, what if I go on a date and after that I ask you, hey, Sunny, do you want to go on another date with this woman? And you're like, yes. And then you ask her privately and she's like, no. And basically, how can we provide you guys the anonymity so that you're, you're it's only exposed if both of you give a yes? Yeah, but if I said yes and she said no and it comes back as no, don't I know for a fact that it's she said no because I said yes? Possibly, but we're trying to, maybe I'm not explaining this correctly. <laughs> hey, hey, you know what, Hartej? I was going to say, I, I'm, I'm actually, to be honest, we can go down this rabbit hole, but I'm actually more interested in your story, dude. Um, I, I wanted to shift gears. Into, well, I mean, if you want to go on down this path, we can, but, um, but I'm... I, 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 we were talking about Credo as how he went down this rabbit hole. Yeah, yeah, it was my bad. <laughs> it's, no, it's my bad. I, was, I went down the <laughs> of analog analogies but yeah, look into Credo. It's an institutional grade cross-chain swaps. And they basically, some of the problems they've set out to solve are large institutions, let's say Goldman Sachs, they don't want to pre-fund a hot wallet on a centralized exchange. So they're not going to go to a famous centralized cryptocurrency exchange today, and they're not going to pre-fund the wallet. Hot wallets mean that it's connected to the internet. It's a wallet on your mobile phone or your laptop or, your, or a website like say Coindesk or Binance or any other centralized exchange or Kraken or Unicoin. And any of these large exchanges, they require large investors to pre-fund at least a percentage 
uh, of the hot wallet for the types of trades you're going to do, especially when it comes to futures and derivatives. And uh, Credo has set out to leverage multi-party computation and their own blockchain network with custom HSMs and using private data centers all around the world uh, to basically enable you to self-host your crypto in a crypto in a Credo wallet where you have full control of your keys and you're able to join this institutional grade network where you can do cross chain uh, movements of all of your digital assets. And so I'm able to basically broadcast how much money is in my wallet that is fully in my control. I have control of my keys as an institution. And so um, as a exchange also on the network, I'm able to say, oh, well, I don't need you to pre-fund anything. I can see transparently that you have enough funds in your hot wallet. And so, yeah, I mean, they're really ahead of their time. Um, things are progressing super fast. They're, you know, working with the likes of HedgeGuard and Deribit. Um, and uh, now that so many institutions and central banks and central governments are dabbling with CBDCs and stable coins, uh, I imagine Credo will uh, become more relevant literally by the day. And so 2021 is going to be their year. They've been in development for a few years now. I spent a lot of 2020 uh, helping them move the operation forward. They have a great, great team, great group of investors. Um, happy to help them move forward. Cool. Uh, hey, Hartej, I guess that that's interesting. People can learn about it more by going to their website. And by the way, I was, I was playing a bit. I, I do know what MPC is, uh, but I think it's fascinating technology. Um, but I just don't want to lose people in the weeds too, because most of, I find like most of the viewers nowadays are just like newer people. And like I said, it's more just like sitting around a fire telling stories. Um, I, I'm really curious about your journey into entrepreneurship. And I've had a bit of a front row seat, right? Like seeing you kind of evolve and grow and just go out there and kill it and then fail and kill it again. And, you know, like that's thus be the story of our, our entrepreneurship journey, right? You fall, you get back up. Um, but, you know, my main kind of goal, Hartej, hey, are you there? I think I lost you there. Hey, Hartej. I'm here, here. Yeah, my main yeah. goal is to inspire others to not just think about NGU, which is like number go up technology and I'm getting we're getting rich, blah, blah, blah. But instead to inspire people to um, consider building a business or some write a book or a YouTube or I don't care, like just do something like your art, your craft, you can bring it to Bitcoin, right? In any way, shape or form. And I've been interviewing people from all walks of life. So yours is a bit of a technical entrepreneurial journey into Bitcoin, DeFi, you know. So curious, any any lessons, any kind of, you know, high level thoughts or, or kind of things you might want to share with people in terms of, you know what I mean? Because it does seem very daunting and scary sometimes to like try and do something in this space, given all the unknowns. But um, you know, you mentioned earlier on that when you met the Bitcoin community, you just felt at home and you, you know, what, et cetera, et cetera. But can you kind of maybe touch on uh, some of those, I don't know, those thoughts? Yeah, that's a great um, question or request. I, I basically would say, um, first and foremost, people should invest the time to learn and invest the ability to learn how to learn. And if they are if they've already gotten to the point that they're watching this show, that probably means that they've started to go down the rabbit hole of interest of crypto. So I would say, go keep going down it and uh, schedule time literally in your day to read uh, in your Calendly. Uh, I use Calendly quite a bit. I know Sunny does as well. You know, it should say read, <laughs> research, like block it out. There needs to be a time. And that's, really what it takes, it takes weeks and weeks, months and months of reading and research to start navigate. It starts with understanding what things are at their core and then tapping into yourself of like, what did you find interesting? Is it the trading side? Is it healthcare? Is it, are you passionate about human longevity, fashion, music? Like no matter what you are passionate about, there is a space within just Bitcoin alone for you to add value within this ecosystem and to find a way to even earn Bitcoin within this ecosystem. And a lot of my driving force early in the space was, wow, I love the people in the space. I'm learning a lot and I need to earn a lot more Bitcoin as fast as possible. 
And it's that last part where you're like, how do I earn more Bitcoin? That made me want to say, I need to build many businesses in this space as fast as I can, because I'd meet legends like Trace Mayer and I'd feel so behind because Trace is like coming up with unique strategies to acquire more Bitcoins when they were a lot cheaper than they are today. And I remember when they were $300 and Trace was like explaining to me strategies and things he's doing to acquire more. And I'm just like, I need to build more businesses fast. I need to add more value in this space somehow. And it comes down to value generation. If you add value, people will give you value. Uh, and I've seen people be so creative, you know, like people like Naomi Brockel, Brockwell, I think that's her last name. And she's in Toronto. She's producing just incredible content and has right in front of our eyes gone from being uh, an intro to, uh, you know, intro to um, crypto. I feel like when I met her, she was interviewing us and just touching the waters. And I feel like in front of our eyes, she is a key opinion leader in the space, uh, rocking on library.io um, and just crushing the online game, right? And there, there's people that I know, like what Ken Bozak, he just tweets a lot, he tweets a lot and he adds so much value as kind of an influencer in the space. He's always selling crypto socks and supporting projects that he's into by printing t-shirts with their names on it and lots of Bitcoin merchandise. Um, there's really a space for everyone. Uh, but what's most important for the growth of the ecosystem is we need more engineers. You know, the rest, everything is really fun and dandy, but this is technical. The world is really technical and the world needs to be more technical, uh, not less. And so I can't help but bring up the fact that we need more world-class engineers in this space. And we need more engineers to build on just Bitcoin. Forget bringing up the growth of other protocols. The, the fundamental... very successful today is because of the fact that there's not that many engineers qualified enough to be developing new products and services and dApps on them. So the majority of the engineers are either on Bitcoin or Ethereum still, and that remains true, you know? And um, there was a time when Bitcoin core developers couldn't pay their rent in their apartment uh, in London. And I remember my friends in Las Vegas were donating Bitcoins to help them pay their rent in London. There's some expense at some expensive rent. Bitcoin was around, I think, one to three dollars. And I, my friends were donating five to six thousand Bitcoin each um, just to help the Bitcoin Foundation and the core devs pay rent and stay alive in the early days of Bitcoin. Um, and hey, hey Tej, uh, I, I want to just uh, ask you something a little bit off uh, off the beaten path here about Bitcoin. But you, you tweeted some stuff around uh, the gentleman who founded Zappos. Um, recently passed away. I saw you had some pictures uh, with with the gentleman, and um, I don't know. I mean, he, I was I was quite struck by how many people came online and just spoke uh, positively about him and how he kind of impacted their lives. So I was just curious. Like, uh, you you knew you knew him? I lived around him for a long time. I, I lived around Tony and uh, his ecosystem in La downtown Las Vegas for a really really long time. And yeah, I, you know, when you look up to people like say Elon Musk, he's a lot of people, since we've been bringing him up, they look up to Elon Musk and, or Jack Dorsey or Mark Zuckerberg, like these icons in our time. And you, you imagine, some people would imagine they're really smart. And then sometimes when you meet these people in person, you sit down with them one-on-one, -on -one, that turns out to be either true or false. And with Tony Shea, when I met him in person, it couldn't be more true about how incredible of a human being he was and how sharp his brain was. I was building my first startup and I just needed someone who has experience building a company to just give me raw advice. And uh, it's, I went to his apartment at seven in the morning. He said, I only have a gap, 7 a.m. He lived two floors above me in downtown Las Vegas. Uh, I, was, I was on the 20th floor and he lived on 22. And he was like, yeah, come up to my apartment. I only got a gap on Tuesday, 7 a.m. And I walk into his apartment and there's, it's like this awesome, beautiful penthouse. It was a building called Ogden. And uh, 
we walked through my whole business plan and I, I remember he specifically was like, is there any way to fit Bitcoin into this? Like, how can you, uh... and I was like, not really at the moment. And he's like, well, it's not really for like the technology, it's for the marketing. <laughs> uh, he was a great marketer. Uh, he definitely wasn't a proponent of Bitcoin for his technology, but he was so hip to things. He was like, you should totally just be like, we accept Bitcoin just to have this massive marketing campaign to say that the biggest restaurants in Vegas now accept Bitcoin. You know, um, this is 2014, 2013. Um, and yeah, he, he had a power of bringing people together. He had a vision of turning downtown Las Vegas into the world's biggest co-working city. He moved to Zappos. Is, Zappos is one of the, it's owned by Amazon now, one of the biggest uh, sellers of shoes in the world and now a lot more. He moved their headquarters from San Francisco into Las Vegas City Hall in downtown Las Vegas. He launched this thing called the Downtown Project in, in which he invested like $500 million of some of his own money and his closest friends and colleagues' money, people like Fred Mosler, co other co-founder of Zappos. And they all put in their money and they moved to downtown Las Vegas to buy up a crazy amount of real estate and to basically turn downtown Las Vegas into like Zappos' campus in a way that uh, NYU is to Manhattan. And like, he basically described how you can't tell in Manhattan which building is NYU's. And he's like, you shouldn't be able to tell which building in downtown Las Vegas is Zappos's. And I want Zappos' employees to be embedded into downtown Las Vegas. And there's gonna be co-working of companies left and right. We're gonna birth new startups. We're gonna birth fashion and creative. He had a grand vision. And uh, some parts came very true and are still very successful. And downtown Las Vegas is a very different place to live today and will forever be because of Tony Shea. And there was some ups and downs and like uh, the unicorn dream didn't completely come true. Um, but a lot of uh, good came out of it. I personally uh, moved. like living in one big incubator. It was like living in a Y Combinator. I would wake up in my building to literally uh, the top venture capitalists in the Valley, visiting Tony, staying in my building and just being sent to my apartment. You know, like I met um, the founder of um, Atari, uh, Nor, uh, Norman Bushnell, you know, he walked into my apartment on a random weekday and said, I was told you guys are building something interesting uh, in this unit because we were living and working out of the same apartment building as a high rise uh, in downtown Vegas. And so Nolan Bushnell, Nolan Bushnell just walked into our apartment. And so, yeah, I mean, Tony was a magnificent human. He, he brought together lots of people uh, and all, a lot of, you know, he was basically, when I lived there, when I first moved there, he was hosting these like TED-like talks uh, two or three times a week with really smart people and they were completely free and the person would give you a signed book that they wrote about and like he invited everyone just to come and it's free and so yeah living there during the first few years of this downtown project was just magnificent we were just building and reaping the reaping the benefits of tony's uh, program uh a lot of the startup companies that he invested into ended up moving out of vegas because it's not a really sustainable uh startup ecosystem and uh, Tony ended up surrounding himself with some of the wrong people. I lost touch with them towards the last two years. And um, what they say is he surrounded himself with a lot of the wrong people and uh, distanced, he distanced himself from a lot of the people that even I know and love that were amazing people to be around. And uh, he went down kind of a dark path, they say. And I don't really know what happened at the end. And I, I, I don't really wanna say more. I, He's gone. And I just want to focus on how much positivity he brought to me personally, because it's because of him, I met so many great people. And there's a lot of crypto people within his ecosystem that he has helped support and help foster their growth. And so that, that's, that's all there that I'll say. Mm, about it. Yeah, man. Well, thanks for sharing that. I, I, yeah. I mean, the, the piece that I always kind of had, uh, you know, been aware of and, and uh, felt like, uh, you know, again, I didn't know the gentleman, but he, Tony seemed like he had this laser focus, this obsession with like customer satisfaction. 
um, that I think permeates, you know, modern day culture to some extent because of, because of him. Right. I mean, whether yeah. you look at like uh, the Jesse's of Kraken, whether you look at the Bezos of, you know, Amazon or whatever, I mean, that seems to be really at the kind of the heart of, um, amazing entrepreneurs and people who leave legacies behind um he realized yeah. that uh, he realized that he was running a sophisticated call center that needed to give the best customer service possible and so you know zappos's building was just it's just a lot of phones a lot of people on the phone people who are willing to say how are you how are your kids how's the weather uh do you want to return your shoes for free like for the fourth time, no problem, you know? And like he created an environment where people loved working there and still love working there. And uh, the focus shifted from, we don't deliver shoes, we deliver happiness. Hmm. Deep. Um, okay, so we talked about your story a little bit. You know, I'm sure we could spend a couple more uh, sessions on it. It's fascinating. We talked a bit about, you know, your entrepreneurial journey and, you know, all the impact you've had. Um, just to switch gears into my, my next kind of final question or whatever is really around what is one truth that you hold? What is one thing that you believe to be true that most others in Bitcoin would disagree with you on? That there is going to I don't know if this is what most people disagree with me on, but I know there's a large number that do, which is that there is going to be a viable place now and in the future for the growth of multiple layer one and layer two protocols. And that's it. That's all you got to say about that. Like that, I can go on and on about that. But. Beautiful. Okay. I can catch that. Um, yeah, I think that's going to be an interesting, you know, you know, at the end of the day, even though I kind of uh, put on a bit of a, uh, the hat of a Bitcoin maximalist, at the end of the day, I'm fundamentally, I'd consider myself a freedom maximalist. Like I really care about freedom. I care about free markets. Hey, uh, yeah. are Ted, are you there? Okay, I didn't lose you. And so, so, so I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of like, you know, ideas and people being able to do what they want to do, um, you know, but at the same time, I see all the kind of, positives of Bitcoin and the momentum and the network effects and, and how even the things like smart contracts, I feel like you can do that on Bitcoin with layer two. Maybe it's not as ubiquitous, et cetera, et cetera, but um, definitely fascinated by it. So, okay, so that's good. Um, just to kind of bring this one home, um, uh, Hartej, a couple other, just a little bit extraneous, but curious, do you think much about um, AI? Uh, and you can take that how you want in terms of like AI as it maybe means, you know, specific kind of narrow bands of AI today or a little bit more futuristic -y kind of esoteric, you know, general AI. But curious, is this something you even think about? Does it come in your radar or you just totally ignore it? I think a lot about machine learning. I think a lot about data. And uh, there's a lot of room for machine learning uh, to be applied into technology today, especially in the blockchain ecosystem. Um, the thing about machine learning though, is it requires large data sets. And there's not a, there, we need more use cases for that in our ecosystem because it's, it's still so new and we need more data. Um, so I would definitely say I am of the inclination that both AI and machine learning are technologies that humanity will continue to have within its power and control and to leverage for the next decade um, I'm really interested in natural language processing. I'm really interested in machine learning and its depths of what it can do with terabytes and terabytes of data. Um, and I'm interested in the marriage of permissionless blockchains and machine learning. And what is possible when things are being written better and faster due to uh, artificial intelligence I mean, even when it comes to things that we do, we audit smart contracts, right? We're using machine learning to write automated tooling that automatically finds the same vulnerabilities that we found in the past. And once that tooling gets written, it gets better and better and smarter and smarter over the years. And so we're leveraging machine learning right now. Uh, it's just about to get better and better and better. And maybe one day things like 100% automated uh, smart contract auditing could be a thing, 
but right now it's not for anybody. Even the people who uh, said they're going to start a company on the basis that they're going to be a automated smart contract auditor. It, you, there's, there has to be a manual, manual portion still. There's no such thing as automated. Um, and so, yeah, I guess in summary, I'm bullish. Uh, I want to see more machine learning engineers build in the blockchain ecosystem. And uh, I'm super excited to see the intersection of AI, machine learning, NLP, and crypto. Like, wow. My, my. Yeah, for sure. Dude, have you played with open, open AI? A little bit, yeah. It's, it writes code for you now. <laughs> Yeah, it's pretty wild. It's pretty, I started messing around with it. I just got access recently. It's uh, it's interesting. I, I don't have any fears of it necessarily taking over the world anytime soon, but uh, definitely powerful as like a, as a tool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think Elon Musk is completely off on, on this one. I don't think he's right on his fear of AI. Well, I don't think he's completely off, but I think that we're too far off from having a legitimate reason to have fear. Some of the questions that he's raising about the things that Google is doing uh, can give you some hints towards why privacy is so important. And so that is a super cool topic for Bitcoiners to discuss because Bitcoiners have been, and crypto people have been so on the forefront of futurism when it comes to individualism, freedom, free markets, and privacy. And like the biggest war right now that we are in, we're in World War III and that world war is on, on privacy and privacy is being ripped away from us now during COVID faster than ever in the name of safety. And I don't know if it's ever gonna come back. And this goes right in line with things like the mass deployment of CBDCs because as central bank digital currencies get deployed, are they going to be deployed with giving humans the right to their privacy? Because the most important privacy that we demand is the privacy in our monetary transactions. If I have no privacy in my monetary transactions, it's a human right to have private monetary transactions on this earth. And it said my internet is unstable. I'll be back. Yeah, dude, we're back, but it's kind of a, it's a little bit shoddy. Maybe for the next one, we'll have to try and, uh, you know, I don't know, maybe get a better internet connection. I don't know if it's on my side or your side, but we'll, we'll figure it out. Um, sure. I, I actually have one here. I don't know. I don't know if it's working or not. Um, okay. Uh, hard edge. Oh, one more kind of just a bit of a, a topic again. I'm not, you know, I'm not saying I believe in it or don't believe in it. I just think it's an interesting topic around Ubi. Have you thought much about this? You know, with the COVID thing, a lot of people are, like kind of getting universal basic incomes to some extent, but I mean, I kind of tie it into the the, the storyline of AI. And if even if AI doesn't get to where uh, Elon is projecting, you know, cars are driving themselves. So if you just look at that one set of like people that drive for a living, and you start going through systematically one by one, I could, you know, maybe in five or 10 years, see how, um, you know, aside from like a pandemic, like there could be a potential for, for less jobs. So just curious, um, I'm definitely not a fan of like government led uh, UBs and printing money and that stuff just sounds icky. But I guess what I'm getting at is, is there maybe a free market technological solution? Like, I don't know if you've seen eToro's founder, Yanni, has launched something called a good dollar. I think it's a bit playful still, but, uh, you know, it's it's still, I think, I think it's, I don't know, I think it speaks to something that resonates with me, at least, which is, you know, how do you create some sort of framework where not where you're making everyone rich, right? Because not for not working, but where you're not at least letting people die because they didn't have $10 that day to feed themselves and their kids. Happiness and pride, they just don't come from welfare. And it's a fundamental human thing that people need to grasp that happiness and pride will never come from welfare. And I do not believe in the welfare state and the growth of co government coercion and and uh, universal basic income in and of itself is a bad name for something that can never be universal because everything is divided by nation state. So nothing, even if it is, even if a country decides to implement some sort of uh, free money in replace for some basic income in replace for the fact that 
robots have taken over your job, it's going to be for your country. And uh, chances are the money is going to be taken from people who add value and distribute it to others. And uh, that historically has been unfair. Um, let's see the Soviet Union, for example, a place where I am sitting. I'm in Ukraine that survived the Soviet Union. Um, free, free market mindsets run rampant here. Uh, it is the third most um, usage of crypto in the world, Ukraine. It's like Russia, U Venezuela, Ukraine. People use crypto a lot here. So talk to me about Ukraine, man. I, I mean, like, cause I, I do feel like there's something going on there. Like whenever you're hiring programmers and stuff around the world, it's like India, but we know, but if you want to do this, you can't find it. It's Ukraine and it comes up more and more. If I hire 10 engineers today, eight of them in Kiev are reliable and great. If I hire 10 engineers in India, two or three of them are reliable and great. And it's not, an insult to India. There's a 1.4 billion people there and they're way more diverse and it's a complicated ecosystem. And Indians have so many different religions and so much different culture. I'm, I'm, way, I'm raving. And uh, you know, you, you, you hire somebody and he's like, I'm fasting today. And the other guy's like, I have a religious holiday tomorrow. And in Ukraine, everyone's the same pretty much. <laughs> and that helps. And they have a strong math background. Uh, the one positive of the Soviet Union was that most people in Eastern Europe that were ex-CIS countries, uh, during the CIS time, the uh, math and science was really strong in these countries. And so for me, my theory is that for the rest of my life, I'm gonna hire engineers in Ukraine and India because I have the ability to, I know I can, and if I had to replace, God forbid, one whole team of engineers, I can here. And it comes down to a balance of incentivization, loyalty, and trust. And in India and in Ukraine, you can viably build out quality teams of engineers are gonna need train swinging a real bat in the blockchain space. You're not gonna like find a senior blockchain engineer off the street there is no market today in 2021 for dozens and dozens of senior blockchain engineers. The good ones are already really rich and they don't want to work for you. And the other ones uh, that are out there in the market, well, they don't need a recruiter to find a good gig. If they're good, they're already friends with Sonny and Sonny can get them a job in like five emails max. Uh, Sonny could just text three of his friends and be like, hey guys, I found a full stack Solidity engineer. Anyone need him or need her? And right, so, uh, and then on top of that, from a security side, if you want to build in blockchain security, you have to have a cybersecurity background and have a quality assurance mindset, and you have to know Solidity really well. So, like, how many humans on earth have had the incentivization to like <laughs> learn Solidity, a new language that Ethereum is built in, and you had a cybersecurity background? It's like super slim, right? And so, we're at, uh, we need more engineers in this space. and in countries like India and Ukraine, due to the fact that their local currencies are weak, you are able to incentivize in USD or Bitcoin your employees for a lower rate. Uh, you know, someone who's making, let's say, full transparency, five to seven K a month as an engineer in Ukraine, that person might cost double, if not 2.5 as much in Silicon Valley. And that person in Silicon Valley is getting paid 2.5x as much as someone in India or Ukraine is not 2.5x as smart. And that's the fact. So I'm tired of hearing people saying that, oh, the world's greatest engineers are all in San Francisco. They're not. <laughs> they are not. Uh, yeah, Hartej, and you know, for, my, for the longest time, my dream was to someday move to San Francisco. That, that was my dream. Um, but we all know kind of what's what's happened in San Francisco. It's really unfortunate. Um, over the last five, six years, every time I went, it just got worse and worse and worse. And then, yeah, I mean, it, and I, then you see stuff. From a mm. developer standpoint, when you're living in San Francisco, there's like no better ecosystem to be an engineer mm. and to learn from other engineers. And yeah. the, openness, the openness of that city is incredible. The energy of that city is incredible. Silicon Valley is incredible. 
the ability, there is still no replacement for a place that is historically invested in failure over and over and then succeeded. Yeah. Right. So they're like, oh, hey, Sonny, you want a million dollars for your startup? Cool. Oh, hey, Sonny, you failed. Here's another million dollars. Oh, hey, Sonny, you failed again. Here's another million dollars. Why? Because Steve Jobs' dad had a startup and his dad raised venture capital. That's three generations ago. And like uh, they were in, they were investing in failure, 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 massive IPO, failure, 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 massive IPO. And so they were, they realized that they need to keep investing into people at an early stage. And mm. they figured out a formula around the UC, the UC educational institutions plus Stanford and being able to hire right from the universities into an ecosystem that has an incredible amount of companies and innovation and capital. Mm. That's, that's Silicon Valley. And people talk a lot of shit about how people are moving to San Francisco to Miami now. Keith Rabawa's on Twitter and every, he's trying to get everyone like Peter Thiel and Keith Rabawa and even mm. in, you got Spectre Noon, uh, Spencer's there. And you've got a, every, the mayor of Miami's meeting with like everybody. He's trying to copy Wyoming's laws into Florida. And I commend him. If I move back to America, I would probably consider Miami. I get it. Uh, but what's even better is not living in America and not paying the U.S. government uh, or having them follow you around the world. Uh, that's, in my opinion, even better. But yeah, if you, yeah. want, you go to go to Puerto Rico to avoid cap gains like everybody else. I mean, everybody I know that has been crushing it in crypto and doesn't want to pay taxes is like taking a one way flight to tax camp a.k.a. Puerto Rico. Yeah. Hey, Hartej, um, you know, I, I keep saying last question, last question, but I just, I don't want to let you go. I, this is, I promise you my last question. Um, uh, you know, one thing I, I touch I touch on Hartej. I hope you're. I hope you're having as much fun as I am. Um, Hartej, one thing I love. Uh, I love t- touching on are these kind of things that most people think about but don't talk about. So money is obviously one of them, and we talked about Bitcoin and all that. But um, the other one is anxiety. Anxiety. I feel like now with you know a lot of people facing the challenges that they're facing in the world, stuck at home, uncertainty, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, um, it's really easy to get down. And so curious, um, how do you hack anxiety in your life? You use exercise, meditation, journaling, family time. I mean, what's your, what's your little secret? Um, lifting free weights, meditation, eating healthy, sauna. Uh, I go from my sauna into the snow. I'm currently in a cold environment. And something I've been thinking to myself was every time I think, that I'm getting a little bit down because it's dark and the sun's not been allowed out a lot and it's snowing and it's winter. It's winter in Eastern Europe. It can get pretty gray. Uh, I think to myself, things aren't that bad. And if I think they're bad, I'm probably just channeling my own negativity out on my surroundings. And uh, I'd say discipline equals freedom. You know, this was something that came into my mind and then I tweeted it out and everyone was like, this is a really famous sentence from some famous person and it's on some podcast and he starts his podcast with it. I I still don't know who this person is and I didn't try to plagiarize anybody, but it was just like this moment in my, I woke up in the morning and I was like, I got to get out of bed. I got to follow a schedule and I got to go to sleep on time and I got to not look at my laptop and not look at my phone for two to three hours before I go to sleep. And I need to, schedule my calendly so that I'm carving out time for myself mm. to, to take care of my health and spend time with my kids mm. and to go to the park and to play and to put my phone into airplane mode. If you don't design your life to suck less, it's going to suck. And a lot of entrepreneurs that have worked in big companies start their own companies. Life still sucks. And it's like, wait, you, you work for yourself. You started your own company, but you decided to just work 14 hours a day and like disrespect your health. Like, what are you, what are you chasing? Take a, take a step back, re-figure out what is life about. Most people are, are only working a productive four hours per day. Uh, after those four hours, go take a nap, eat lunch, um, recuperate, and then maybe try another two hours. Um, I remember yeah. when we were 
being in college, you would, the, the, you know, science told us that you can only intake material 50 minutes at a time, and then you got to take a 10 minute break, and then you can digest material 50 minutes at a time. And like, this is just how the brain works. You got to take breaks. Uh, you can't just keep going. Um, and like someone said to me yesterday, how do you spend so much time with your kids? Every time I call you, I hear them in the back and like, you're being a good dad and stuff. And I'm like, how do you not? <laughs> like you, you design, you're your own boss. You, you don't have some shitty job that only gives you eight days off a year. Like you need to take, you get yourself in the driver's seat of your own life and make sure you have me time, time for you and your loved one, time for you and your family and your kids time for your health. I think the most important is like alone time. Every human needs to be in love with themselves in order for other people to love them. So you are what you eat. Be mindful of your diet. Intermittent fasting has been a life changer for me. I've been intermittent fasting for uh, well over seven years. And now there's all these apps to make it easier. And there's all these wearables to tell you about how you're sleeping. So I highly encourage like to me, Human longevity is a passion, an increased passion, especially after dealing with my father who had brain cancer and I saw his body deteriorate in front of me and it made me realize we are what we eat, you know, and if you start taking fish oil every day with turmeric and chaga extracts and mushrooms and lion's mane and whey protein and creatine, lift free weights, meditate, take cold showers, go to the sauna, like exercise, I mean, this information is now so readily out there. A few years ago, I felt like I had to really research deeply to figure out about things like hypertrophy, strong lifting five by five, um, you know, finding like, there's a guy named Mark Ripto. He had these YouTube videos a long time ago and they're still out there. Eight years ago, I found Mark Ripto videos to learn proper uh, free weight body lifting form, like how to squat properly, how to bench press properly, how to lift weights above your head. People have trainers are garbage compared to Mark Ripto. <laughs> and like, it's important to invest time into your health. And the more you invest in your health mentally and physically, the more successful you're going to be. You will pursue your passions faster for sure. And like, oh yeah, I love it, dude. I'm not gonna lie, I was a little bit under the weather before our call today, you know, with all the news in India, blah, blah, blah. But I'm feeling great now. I'm ready to take on the world. Um, I feel I feel energized, my friend. Um, Hartej, where do people by the way, we gotta do this again, uh, sooner than later. I know this is like my third or fourth attempt at trying to get you on. <laughs> you're a busy guy so people should be happy that we got you on today um and and also i'm active on twitter my dms are open h-a-r-t-e-j um sawney s-a-w-n-e-y beautiful so website s-a-w-n-e-y uh website zokyo like tokyo with a z dot i-o z-o-k-y-o dot i-o my dms are open on twitter i'm very open please reach out to me, DM me, bother me. Uh, don't expect a response right away, but I probably 40, 48 to 72 hours is fair. Okay. Are you on Clubhouse? I'm on Clubhouse. Woo, 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 woo. Let's go host a room together. Yeah, let's go host a room. Then. <sighs> I'm game. Go on because I, I don't have time to just get on there and wait because then it becomes mm, useless. I'd no, like I to talk to you and we'll go I to some I, 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 I've been, I've been, I've been tinkering with the tech, just kind of playing with it, but I'm, I'm obviously planning kind of a move. Like, you know, you've been to my events, like 10, like with thousands, tens of thousands of email addresses of people. So my goal is to use a clubhouse to reignite those meetups and like do them on a global scale. But, you know, we can have different topics, different times, but I'd love to start doing little mini you know, talks where we get on there and people come on stage or whatever. I love it. I love it. Okay, Hartej, I love you, my friend. Uh, tell your family I said uh, Happy New Year, the best to them. I, I'm, I'm so happy for you and everything that's happening. And so with that, yeah, I guess we'll bring it to an end. Just hang out for maybe 10 seconds. Any final words? Are we good? No, just stack sats, spread love. And uh, I hope to see everyone soon. Stay smiling. Love yourself. Woo woo. Okay, here we go. I'm going to kill this now.